Assalamu alaikum. It is an honor to be invited by the University of Pakhtia to give a keynote speech. Now, thank you, first of all, to Professor Miraga Manawi from the Engineering Faculty for being the liaison. Today, I congratulate all of you for organizing the first national conference that focuses on the economic development of Afghanistan. If you are not already aware of this, on 26th September 2023, financial market updates around the world report how the Afghani dollar has surged 9% against the US dollar in the last three months. The headline in Business Insider states, the Taliban controlled Afghani has thrashed the US dollar this quarter, becoming the world's best performing currency. On Bloomberg's website, the headline reads, Taliban controls the world's best performing currency this quarter. It continues to state in their byline that Afghani erases losses it saw after the Taliban's 2021 takeover. Now, from an outsider's point of view, it looks like the economy in Afghanistan is doing very well. The surge in the Afghani dollar has sparked some optimism of the country's economic prospects. A stable currency, as we know, can attract foreign investments and promote economic growth, which is very much aligned to the theme of the conference. Nonetheless, I would like to raise this question. How can this translate into economic development that can be sustained for generations to come in Afghanistan? I am not an economist. I'm an educator whose role is now in policy making. My views are biased in favor of education. So my next question is this. Can Afghanistan leverage the power of education to elevate our society out of poverty? I believe we can. You are probably aware that there are 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs out of which only one focuses on quality education. Goal four's mission is to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong opportunities for all, unquote. For decades, education in developing countries meant achieving universal primary education only. Now, in a 1985 World Bank discussion paper, it states that 85% of children in Afghanistan aged 6 to 11 are out of school. A more updated statistic in 2018 states that there are more than 4.5 million children who do not attend schools, of which between 2.3 million and 2.6 million are primary aged children. Primary education had been a priority for years, but in the recent years, scholars are beginning to demonstrate that investing in higher education can indeed bring economic growth to a country. In South Africa, a nine-year study found that a person with a primary education on average has an 82% probability of becoming poor in the future based on a food poverty line. But if that person has a tertiary education, the probability of becoming poor in the future was 31%. The general trend shows that the more education an individual obtains, the lower the probability of falling into poverty. In other words, there is a direct correlation between education and reduced vulnerability to poverty. Now think about that. Moving eastward to Tanzania, it's evident that secondary education reduces the chances of being poor as a working adult by a staggering 60%. Now, this is a testament to the idea that equipping our youth with higher levels of education can break the shackles of poverty. Simply put, more education meant less poverty. Now, here is a caveat. Much of the investments and foreign aid in Afghanistan come from non-governmental organizations and external agencies. 
According to a 2021 official report to the United States Congress, the U.S. government had made available approximately $144.4 billion in funds for reconstruction and other related activities in Afghanistan since 2002. Now, from that pie, $36.03 billion was for governance and development and $4.14 billion for humanitarian aid. This does not include funding sources from other foreign governments and non-governmental organizations. But this reliance on external funding does not mean the de facto government can afford to step back and not lift a finger. If not, you might run into the poverty trap, an economic phenomenon where individuals or groups of people or even countries remain trapped in a cycle of poverty because of weak institutions being put in place like colonial warlords or because of climates that foster disease or geographies that limit access to global markets or simply by the fact that poverty is overwhelmingly self-perpetuating. That is why I believe good economic governance and a strong educational policy must go hand in hand to solve this recurring problem to escape this trap of the poverty cycle. But what are the benefits of tertiary education? Let me just highlight two. The first, human capital and innovation. The development of human capital and the nurturing of innovation are inherent to tertiary education. Such education prepares countries for the global knowledge economy. A skilled workforce can drive technological innovations. You know, when I was growing up in Singapore, our Ministry of Education has many ICT in education master plans over the last four decades, the very first one in the 1990s. It equipped teachers with a basic level of digital competency, eventually having computer technology to be widely used in schools. The plans changed from integrating ICT into the curriculum in the early 2000s to developing student dispositions to succeed in the knowledge economy and eventually becoming a responsible digital citizen. If you see a Singaporean kid today, you will see that they are so equipped and adept in using technology. Today we are faced, however, with artificial intelligence, neural networks and machine learning. The latest mobile phone technology is one good example. It can detect face recognition, fingerprint scans, and even do transcriptions or translations into different languages. What our students learn today will be obsolete tomorrow. That is why we need to develop a population who are curious about the world, curious enough to challenge old norms, curious enough to create new innovations. And the foundation for that kind of curiosity is best done at home, in schools and universities. The second benefit to tertiary education is to counter consequences of underinvestment. Countries that neglect tertiary education risk brain drain, stagnant economic growth, and growing wealth inequalities. Let me explain how tertiary education can retain and keep skilled professionals in the country. India, for example, has made substantial investments in higher education, leading to the growth of institutions like the Indian Institutes of Technology, IITs. Now, these institutions produce top-tier engineers and scientists who have contributed significantly to India's technology sector and reduced brain drain. As a result, India has become a global IT hub, benefiting its economy and stemming the outflow of talent. But it is not just information technology. It is a creative and innovative spirit that is part of the human capital. In one example of Nabrangpur in Orissa, one of the hundred aspirational districts in India, various departments of the Ministry of Science and Technology came together to uplift the district by providing low-cost water filters for clean drinking water, training farmers in sustainable agriculture, teaching them how to make fresh water ponds and grow fish, and explaining the significance of millets to improve health and nutrition. Making India the top of the list of countries who are making significant efforts towards the sustainable development goals for environmental protection. You don't need to depend fully on foreign aid 
if you have local talents here. Now let's take a look at another example from the Far East with brands that we know and perhaps love. Samsung, LG, Kia, Hyundai. That's right, in the South Korea. South Korea's remarkable economic growth is known as a miracle on the Han River, partly fueled by investments in higher education. With a highly educated workforce, it attracted foreign investments and technology transfers, driving economic growth. Now, when Korea joined the OECD in 1996, their GDP per capita was still about 30% below the OEC average in European countries. And over the next 25 years, Korea carried out major economic reforms, aligned its policies on OECD best practice in many areas, increased its integration into the global economy, and enhanced its technological and human potential further, leading to the convergence of its GDP per capita to the OECD average. In that short period of time, South Korea transformed from being a developing nation to a high income country, showing a positive correlation between education and economic development. I don't think I need to belabor the point further. Tertiary education is no longer a privilege for the wealthy. It is a basic human right and a necessity. To ensure sustained economic growth and societal advancement, we must commit to an integrated, clear, accessible system of tertiary education. Now, it is not just university that I'm referring to, but polytechnics, technical or vocational schools, and even community colleges. Now, no longer will I be able to say, oh, my sister does not need an education, or oh, my son can complete primary education and then help me out with my business. When we prepare our children and our youths for an equitable education and later to a skilled workforce, we're not just inserting them into the holes in the industry simply to fulfill a job role. Yes, we all need doctors, engineers, technicians, and entrepreneurs. But we also need teachers, philosophers, artists, journalists, counselors, and humanitarian workers. We are building human capital that not only builds innovation and boosts economic productivity, but we are also developing creative problem solvers. I remember in my last speech at Park Chae University, I told the graduates not to simply look for jobs, but to create jobs. Job creation is value creation. Together, let's champion the value of tertiary education, invest in it wisely, and harness its unparalleled potential for the betterment of Afghanistan as part of a global community. Thank you.